Saudi Arabia was crushed instantly. There was such an intimidating military force, nobody even showed up. And that was considered fine, so pat on the wrist. Uh, so they keep their population under control, but they also have most of the oil. And they make sure that it works the way the West wants. So they're the ones who, they can support jihadism, they can set up uh, uh, madrasas throughout the Arab world to train, and in fact even elsewhere like Pakistan to train uh, jihadis, the US and Britain don't mind as long as they serve their main function. It's quite consistent, in the, you see it in the internal records of both the US and Britain, Do you see any chance of the uprising in Libya? Sorry, who's talking? Do you see any chance of the uprising in Libya having any spillover effect into Gaza? Do you see any chance of having the population of Gaza um, uprise in a similar manner? I don't think there's an uprising in Gaza. Hamas is a pretty brutal outfit. And they run the place. They run a very tight ship. Uh, in fact, you can see developing a sort of a tacit agreement between uh, Israel, uh, Hamas, and the Palestinian Authority to keep things the way they are. Uh, that allows Hamas to run Gaza. It allows the Palestinian Authority, you know, sort of a subsidiary to Israel and the U.S to run Gaza Strip, and of course Israel likes it. But there's, I mean, there was an effort, there were, you may have, about a year ago, I guess, there was a very brave statement of a number of young, a group of young people in Gaza who came out through some electronic medium, I forgot how, uh, with a, a, a strong statement calling for you know, freedom for justice, for an end to oppressive rule, and so on. They were, nobody knows what happened to them. They were crushed pretty quickly. Uh, the West Bank, it's kind of the same. There's, a, there's an army which was originally uh, trained and run by a U.S. general, Keith Dayton, now it's some other general, I forget who, uh, uh, which, uh, it works with the Palestinian Authority, and its a task is essentially to keep the population quiet. Uh, in fact, when, uh, when the time of the invasion of Gaza, uh, there, were no, there was concern that there might be protests in the West Bank, but there weren't any, because the Dayton army simply crushed them. And they were pretty proud of it. Uh, General Dayton himself gave a speech, you can pick it up on the internet, to uh, the Washington Institute of Near East Policy, it was called, a, it's basically an offshoot of APAC, they call it an independent uh, policy agency, in which he uh, praised the achievement. He said, we did a really great job. We kept any protests from developing. In fact, we did such a good job that uh, the Israeli army, which of course we work in close connection with, was able to take forces out of the West Bank and use them for the attack on Gaza. Uh, thanks to the U.S. Uh, uh, Palestinian Authority cooperation through the Dayton Army, which kept them quiet. Uh, senator uh, John Kerry, who's uh, you know, our senator, who's the, uh, uh, so he's sort of Obama's point man on the Middle East. He's the one who goes out and negotiates and so on. Uh, he made a speech at the Brookings Institution. This would have been February 2010, I guess, maybe about a year ago, in which he, uh, he said that things are kind of improving in the region. Uh, for the first time ever, he said, Israel has a legitimate negotiating partner. You know, they've been pleading for years for somebody to negotiate with them. And now finally they have a negotiating partner, Palestinian Authority, and he had one bit of evidence, the Dayton Army. His evidence was that the Dayton Army was so effective that it uh, was even able, it was able to ensure that there would be not even a protest when uh, Israel invaded Gaza. So that shows things are, are improving, you know. Uh, but I, I don't, to get back to your question, I think at least as things now stand, the chances of uh, 
uh, any uprising in Gaza seem very slim. They're just under way too much pressure, both internally and from Israel and uh, up, up till now from Egypt. If there is a real democracy opening in Egypt, Egyptian policy might change, and Israel's quite worried about it. At West Bank, it's conceivable that there could be uh, some kind of resonance to the uh, uh, general protests throughout the region, but it hasn't happened yet. Professor? Hi, good evening, in the back, on the first floor. Um, you mentioned that a lot of the news coming out of that region doesn't reach the United States, and a lot of the messages that we do find in the mainstream media are, are biased. Um, can you make some recommendations on some either websites that we can read or newspapers or periodicals that would allow us to gain a more balanced view of what's going on in that region? By now, there are plenty of sources available if you are willing to do a little work. Like for direct coverage, regular coverage, daily coverage, I mean, there's nothing that compares with Al Jazeera. Uh, it's uh, it's highly professional coverage. It has its limits. Like Al Jazeera is based in Qatar, and they don't say anything about Qatar. And they don't, uh, you know, for example, when, uh, uh, when the uprising was crushed in Bahrain, uh, they didn't say anything about it, and barely said anything about it, because the Qatari government supported it. But with such limits, they do very good reporting. And in fact, they're the only you know, really expert, uh, hour, almost hour by hour, reporting of the main things that are happening. Like during the Gaza invasion, now they were giving 24-hour uh, coverage on the ground. Uh, there was almost nothing else there. Uh, during these uprisings, like, say, Egypt, Tahrir Square, uh, they were the ones who were uh, right on top of it. Uh, they have Arab-speaking journalists, uh, very high quality, and so on. Uh, they're kept out of the United States. I think there are two towns in the U.S. where you can even get it on cable television. And most of the world pick it up right away. But you can get it on the Internet. Uh, and there are, uh, there are websites. First of all, you can get other journals. You can get other newspapers. So if you read, say, the British press, I don't want to say it's magnificent, but on this issue it's a little more open. Uh, you can get pretty good reporting in the, uh, the, the Guardian, the Independent, and so on, mixed with other stuff. And there are, uh, if you take a look at some of the main web, pop, you know, popular web, you know, general po uh, uh, websites, say ZNet, there's a ton of material coming out constantly. I mean, you've got to evaluate it. Not all of it makes any sense. You know, it's like everything else. You have to use your judgment. But there's certainly a much broader variety. Uh, you better go to where the mic is. Uh, um, I've heard some reports too at various books that uh, the United States provided a lot of funding for the back of war in Afghanistan and brought a lot of the guns and tanks into that region. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. I can't hear. Uh, and the, the U.S. funding uh, Gaddafi uh, in the Vietnam. Funding Gaddafi? Yeah, and a lot of the, a lot of regimes big military funding into other countries. I mean, the, the, the U.S. US support for Gaddafi is surreal. And that's, it's amazing the way it's being suppressed. Like, you know, right now, a couple of, two weeks ago, uh, there, there's a trial underway in The Hague, you know, International Tribunal. Uh, the International Tribunal on Sierra Leone, uh, atrocities in Sierra Leone, which were horrible. Uh, the person on trial is Charles Taylor. The chief prosecutor is an American law professor from Syracuse University. Uh, he was very bitter about that. The trial just ended. Uh, he was very bitter about it because he wanted to try Gaddafi. He said they have evidence that uh, Gaddafi was the main person responsible, as he put it, for the killing over a million people uh, in Sierra Leone. But Britain and the United States blocked it. And when he was asked why, he said, welcome to the world of oil, you know, period. Uh, right in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, there's a group based in the Harvard Business School, 
it's called, what's it called? I forget the name of it, but uh, they were just exposed by a Boston Globe reporter. Uh, they have been providing services to Gaddafi, including uh, writing uh, you know, a, a PR material for him, uh, praising his magnificent uh, thoughts about uh, society and uh, democracy and so on. Uh, big shots at the Harvard Business School. Uh, in England, it's, you know, in England it actually hit headlines. So the head of the London School of Economics had to resign. So when they have a, if they have an opportunity to get rid of them, they'll be happy to do it. Uh, but uh, whereas, say, King Abdullah or something, then they, he can do what he likes. Uh, but it's, uh, but yes, there's been plenty of support. I mean, these ought to be headlines. All of these things. Uh, well, you better find the mic. Cause <laughs> who's got the mic? It's up there. Where? Oh. oh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in your opinion, if the United States was able to switch entirely to domestically produced renewable energy resources, and we no longer need to rely on any oil from the Arab world, how, what sort of an impact would this have on U.S. air relations? Approximately zero, in my opinion. <laughs> There's a lot of mythology about this. I mean, the, the U.S. doesn't get most of its oil from the Middle East. In fact, if you look at U.S. energy policy, so for example, you know, the year 2000, last Clinton year, they came out with a big study of uh, energy, and the conclusion was uh, the U.S., of course, has to control the Middle East, but that goes way back. But it should, uh, that's a matter of world control. But uh, the U.S. itself, it said, should rely on at more secure Atlantic Basin supplies, the meaning Western Hemisphere and uh, West Africa. So the rest of the world can rely on insecure supplies, but we got to make sure we rely on secure ones. In fact, if you look back at the history, it really is surreal. Uh, so back in, in the 1950s, for example, the U.S. was the main, by far the main producer, in fact, the main exporter. Uh, the Eisenhower administration made a decision to, uh, 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 to um, essentially eliminate U.S. domestic resources, to, to uh, uh, take U.S. oil only from Texas, which was much more expensive than from Saudi Arabia. But this was for the benefit of Texas oil producers. So there was a decision to exhaust U.S. domestic resources. Of course, they couldn't exhaust it, but to deplete U.S. domestic resources for the benefit of Texas oil producers and a couple of corrupt cabinet members who pretty soon were, you know, big shots in the uh, Texas oil system and, uh, and to pay a lot more for it. So Americans paid a lot more for oil. Uh, you know, that's what they were doing. In a, and that went on for, I think, 14 years, right through the Democratic administrations of the 60s. Now, what they were essentially doing was depleting U.S. oil resources, leaving big holes in the ground, which we now call the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, and we fill it up from imported oil from Saudi Arabia. You know, I mean, these systems are run in order to make money uh, for the right kind of people, not for reasons of security. And today, to get back to your question, if the U.S. were running 100% on solar power, we'd have exactly the same policies towards the Middle East. You go back to, to the global planning at the end of the Second World War. It was recognized pretty clearly, in fact said, quote, one of the leading advisors, one of 
Roosevelt Truman's leading advisors, that uh, if we can control Middle East oil, uh, we will have substantial control of the world because it, it's, it's such a powerful instrument of control. And that remained true right through the 50s when the U.S. wasn't using, practically not using the oil at all, and it would continue today. These are instruments of world control. Hello, Barossa. Um, this entire conversation appears to be revolving around a relationship with Israel. Um, after Israel, uh, the United States donates more money to uh, Egypt than any other country. Uh, and we're also talking about Egypt. Uh, when talking about uh, Israel's decisions about how to relate to its neighbors, you're talking about the demographic problem, and you were talking about the, uh, the blockade of the wall, and also our blockade of the Gaza Strip. However, the blockade of the Gaza Strip is impossible without Egypt's help. Uh, and I believe that's why we give money to Egypt, and that's why we back and bark to protect Israel and to allow them to defend their demographic. demographic situation. What, my question is, what is it that's compelling us to do such acts for Israel? Like, what is it that we're so interested in? Is it about so the oil? What, yeah, what's the source of U.S. support? You're, you're perfectly right. I mean, the... Uh, um, one of the reasons the U.S. and Israel, and Israel were upset about uh, the threat to Mubarak uh, was that he was cooperating in the strangulation of the Gaza Strip. That's only one part of it. Uh, his... Uh, agreement. There was a peace treaty between Egypt and Israel in 1979. Uh, there's a long history of that, but the effect of the treaty was understood right away. It freed Israel up to carry out aggressive actions elsewhere. So you read Israeli strategic analysts, say Avner Yaniv, right in 1980. You know, he said, okay, now Israel's free. We, we, we're not going to have, we don't have any threat from Egypt, you know, so therefore we're free to attack Lebanon, say, which they did right after that was their big invasion of Lebanon. Uh, and it's sort of been kept that way. So for, if, uh, if Egypt did have a democratic uprising, you know, succeeded, uh, almost certainly that arrangement wouldn't remain, or at least, you know, it would reduce in character, and then Israel would be forced to... Uh, uh, deploy forces in the, the southern region and so on. Uh, so why is the U.S. supporting Israel? Well, that's a very interesting question. Uh, and if you look closely, you can find reasons. So just ask yourself for a minute, where is the strongest support coming from? So take, say, the press. I mean, the most rabid pro-Israel newspaper is the Wall Street Journal. Now, the Wall Street Journal is not part of the lobby. It's the, it's the newspaper of the business world. Uh, the Republicans are far more extreme in support of Israeli expansion and atrocities than the Democrats. Uh, Jewish votes and Jewish money tend to go to the Democrats. But again, the Republicans are the business party. I mean, they're so deep in the pockets of corporate America, you need a telescope to find them. You know, that's their, well, that's, their that's what they are. You know. And so they're strongly supportive of Israel. If you look at the business community at large, you see pretty much the same thing. Uh, they think uh, Israel's fine. So uh, U.S. investment in high-tech industry in Israel keeps going up. Uh, uh, Intel, major chip producer in the world, uh, has a new generation of chips coming out that they say is going to, they think, will take over the world market. And their main factory they're building right now is in Israel. Uh, they have a, a, a military industry. Uh, for them, Israel's a bonanza. So say, take Lockheed Martin. Uh, when the United States uh, essentially gives Israel uh, F-35s, that's a huge boost for Lockheed Martin. But remember, it's a double boost, because when the U.S. gives arms to Israel, uh, that's what's called in retail marketing a teaser. It, uh, what it means is that Saudi Arabia, which has all the money, they're going to come along and say, we want something like that too. And then the U.S. can send second-rate arms, which they can't use anyway, uh, to Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states. 
And in fact, Obama just made a, you know, $3 billion to Israel, but he just made a $60 billion deal with Saudi Arabia. Well, you know, that, that's for a long time been the way in which the U.S., and to a lesser degree Britain, uh, recycle petrodollars, uh, keep military industry functioning, and so on. So they love it. And they're a big lobby, you know, they're very powerful. Uh, U.S. military intelligence, military and intelligence, have had pretty close relations with Israel since the 50s and uh, maintain them. Uh, apart from all these kind of concrete uh, bases of support, there are kind of cultural issues which I don't think should be dismissed. So uh, the U.S., I don't have to tell you, is a, an unusually religious country. It's kind of off the spectrum, international spectrum in religious belief. And it's not just evangelicals, that's elites, it's elites too. And in fact, Christian Zionism, both in Britain and the United States, goes back way before Jewish Zionism. You know, it goes back to the 19th century before the Jewish Zionist movement even took off. And it's quite real. So for example, during the First World War, when British General Allenby uh, conquered Jerusalem from the Turks, you just take a look at the headlines in the mainstream US and British press. Uh, Richard, uh, General Allenby was Richard the Lionhearted, literally, uh, rescuing the Holy Land from the infidels. In other words, he was winning the War of the Crusades, finally. Uh, huge cheers, you know. Well, the next thing after we get the Holy Land back from the infidels is you have to follow the words of the Bible. Well, you know, the Lord, to be precise, the war god, that's who the Lord of the Old Testament is, the war god uh, promised uh, the land of Israel to the Jews. So we got to bring the Jews back. Uh, that's fulfilling God's will. Uh, you go on to say the Roosevelt administration, not secular administration, but uh, one of Roosevelt's main advisors, Harold Dickey's, uh, secular of course, said that the return of Jews to Palestine then is uh, the, I think the greatest achievement in human history. He said something like that. And this goes all the way to the present. You know, the, it's, a, it's an extremely religious country. It extends over much of the population. And people like Woodrow Wilson and uh, um, Harry Truman, uh, they're reading the Bible every day. And the Bible tells you things, like it tells you it's our holy land, doesn't belong to the infidels, they don't belong there. Uh, and the Jews have to go back, and then if you go way off to the Christian right, and you get into the revivalist movement, okay, then there's more things happening. Like uh, that movement actually really took off in 1948. Uh, the Jews were back in uh, Palestine, you go to the, now Israel, you go to the Book of Revelations, uh, it goes on until you have you know, Armageddon and everybody slaughters each other, which is wonderful because the souls that are saved rise to heaven, including incidentally 144,000 Jews for some reason, but uh, uh, the rest are eternal damnation. So we've got to put press this. And you know, this again is not you know, strange preachers in Texas. Now, this is right in the White House. So for example, take say George W. Bush. Well, it hasn't been discussed much, but uh, when Bush was trying to get international support for the invasion of Iraq, we're now talking about January 2003, uh, he met with uh, uh, the president of France, Chirac, and uh, we sort of have the documents from the French side, uh, but uh, uh, Bush apparently started ranting about some extremely obscure passage in the book of Ezekiel. It's about uh, Gog and Magog, and nobody knows what it means. I mean, are they people, are they places, uh, whatever it is. But according to this passage, Gog and Magog <coughs> come down and you know destroy Israel, and then comes Armageddon and all kind of things. Uh, Chirac had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> so he, uh, he asked the French Foreign Office, the Elysee, if they could explain to him what this maniac is raving about. And they didn't know. So they contacted a Belgian theologian. Actually, that's, that's how I found out about 
the Belgian theologian sent me a copy of a disquisition that he wrote to the French Foreign Office explaining the interpretations of this obscure passage and its role in you know, Christian uh, right, uh, you know, fantasies. Uh, well, you know, this is in the White House. I mean, uh, that, that stuff is not insignificant. Uh, and there are other things, too. Uh, the United States, remember, is a settler colonial society. Uh, the whole so-called Anglosphere, you know, the expansion of England, is settler colonial imperialism. The United States, Canada, and Australia. Now, that's the most vicious form of imperialism because it means wiping out the indigenous population. The French sort of was the same in Algeria, but most imperialism wasn't that way. It's the Anglosphere, which is typically settler colonial. And that's deep in our history. I mean, I don't know about you, but when I was a little kid, we were playing cowboys and Indians, and we were cowboys killing the Indians. You know, I think it's a little better these days, but this is really deep in the culture. It's a settler colonial society. We belong here. They don't. Uh, they were, uh, you know, all kinds of stories about how they don't. They didn't really have any right to the land and should be. It's all. It's right through the the most uh, you know elite uh, literature. You know, it's not not crazy stuff. Uh, and that, that's just part of general consciousness. And you take a look at Israel, that's what it is, settler colonial society. It's uh, you know, an advanced uh, culture of Europeans uh, coming into this land, uh, eliminating the barbarians who don't belong there in the first place. Uh, and uh, there's a kind of a natural sympathy that uh, develops. I mean, I think all of these are factors that shouldn't be ignored. Uh, how deep they are is another question, but uh, I mean, you could have said the same with South Africa. In fact, it was true in South Africa. There was a very natural association. South Africa is another settler colonial society. It, uh, and there's a natural uh, kind of sympathy in white America with uh, white nationalist racism. It was real, you know. And uh, nevertheless, the U.S. did change policy. I think it's a very good comparison. Uh, first of all, in the case of Israel, there's two questions. One is Israel itself, and secondly, the occupied territories. Uh, Israel itself has, is a discriminatory society. And there's plenty of discriminatory laws, and I've been writing about them for years, but it's nothing like apartheid. In fact, it's more like the United States has been through much of its history and still to some extent is. So it's bad, and it should be overcome, and there are things to say about it, but it's not apartheid. Uh, on the other one, you get to the occupied territory, it's much worse than apartheid, much worse. Uh, just remember, white South Africa needed the black population. They were its workforce, uh, just like uh, the slave states in the South needed the black population. Uh, that's the workforce, can't get rid of them. Uh, and if you, if you need, in fact, if you go back to the Civil War, it's worth reading the debates. They're not, I mean, the, the slave owners had arguments. They thought they were right, you know, and they justified their position. And they had arguments, some of which were never really answered. Uh, so for example, uh, to be anachronistic, uh, if I own a car and you rent the same car and we come back a year later, which one's gonna be in better shape? Well, mine will. Since I own it, I'll take care of it. Now, you don't own it, so you know, if it gets dented or something happens, you won't do anything. Well, that's the slave owner's argument. We own our workforce. You rent them. So we take care of our workforce. You don't. You can just toss them out if you, it's called wage labor. You rent them. You don't want them anymore, you toss them out. You have no responsibility for them. So we're the ones who are moral and you're immoral. Well, you might think about whether there's an answer to that. Uh, anyhow, that's the, uh, 
that was essentially the South African white stand. Now, we take care of the Baptist ends because we need them. And in fact, to some extent, they did. There was some development in the Baptist stands, uh, uh, partly for this reason, partly because they were trying to make them you know, enough of a showcase so that the world would recognize them. perfectly happy to get rid of them all. Uh, they're just a nuisance, you know. So they don't take care of them, they don't support them. I mean, they're, they're just a nuisance, get rid of them. I mean, they used to use them as a workforce years ago, but that uh, ended quite a while ago. Uh, partly it, because it ended because of the success of what's called neoliberalism. Uh, neoliberalism is the set of policies that the U.S. and its allies imposed on much of the world uh, through the World Bank and the IMF and the World Trade Organization and so on. They're very highly regarded if you're taking economics courses, they'll tell you how wonderful it is. Uh, but in fact, it, it, it devastated the societies and it left uh, uh, a huge number of people in total misery. Uh, one of the reasons why there's so much uh, uh, immig immigration from Mexico, there are others, but that's one. Uh, well, uh, as this plague sp spread around the world, Israel was able to get very cheap labor from uh, uh, Thailand, you know, Latin America, uh, Romania, you know. Uh, actually, their favorites were from China. There wasn't neoliberalism there, but the favorites, uh, they were they were called slave labor which is virtually what they were, contract labor. Uh, they take away their passports, you know, they're under the control of the, uh, the, the contractor who brings them in. Now, the beauty of China was that Chinese labor was that if they ever protested, so like maybe they wanted their wages paid or something, you could just call in the Chinese embassy and the Chinese embassy would lay down the law. You see, you shut up or we're gonna send you back to China and you know what's gonna happen to you there. Uh, so that was a nice arrangement. Uh, but uh, as long as they have that uh, cheap uh, semi-slave workforce, they don't need Palestinians anymore. If they have Palestinians, they more or less have to take care of them. In any event, in the, in the occupied territories, I think it's a lot worse than apartheid. Um, there was nothing in the Bantu stands that's treated, say, like Gaza or even the West Bank. So in two respects, I don't think it's a valid analogy. But there is a valid analogy, I think, namely the one I mentioned. That's almost never discussed because there's one taboo topic in the United States and in the West generally, namely uh, actual power. The actual power of the United States and its allies and the way they run the world, it's kind of taboo. You're not supposed to talk about that. So that's sort of excluded although it's the core issue, or maybe because it's the core issue. We're going to take two more. Thank you. Uh, in the last 30 years that I've been involved in this issue, uh, I've seen an, an enormous increase in public awareness on this question. More op-eds printed, more letters to the editor, even a growth of awareness within the American Jewish community. Just incredibly different. 30 years ago, Norman Finkelstein and I, Finkelstein and I spoke here, and we were shouted down. And it's just an incredible difference between you know, this evening. But nonetheless, even though that has happened, many, many people here have been to the West Bank and Gaza and so on, Congress, no matter what Israel does, invade Lebanon, invade Gaza, build settlements which humiliate our, you know, our diplomats and so on, and statements like this. Whenever Israel does something outrageous, they have a resolution that comes forward, and everyone votes for it, including our own representative, who's a great guy on all kinds of social issues. And I've met with him and brought him information and whatever. What can we do to reverse this so that somebody like Deval Patrick, for instance, would even have a clue that making a business arrangement, which he just did with Israel, has some moral overtones and political overtones? Nobody would have done that in the 80s with South Africa. They would have known that there was a political cost, or they might have known there was a political cost. What can we do to help that? Because despite the public opinion, members of Congress are overwhelmingly voting, you know, unquestionably for always. Yeah. Well, what you say is absolutely right. I mean, I've been doing this since the 60s. 
I mean, not very long ago, I'd have to have police protection. I was giving a talk. And yes, meetings were broken up and just even a couple of years ago. So yeah, that's changed enormously. Uh, but uh, uh, the comparison to South Africa in the 80s is not quite accurate because, you know, by the 80s, uh, even U.S. business was opposed to apartheid. Okay. Uh, that Congress was passing resolutions and so on. I mean, you compare it to the 60s or the 50s, it's more like the case of Israel. Uh, there's you know, a lot of public opposition too, uh, races, races, but nothing, nothing in, you know, in, in public policy. Uh, it took a lot of work. There was a lot of uh, uh, organizing, activism, education, and it made a breakthrough. So the first, I think the first um, sanctions proposal at a university at least, as I recall, I think it was as late as 1977 at Hampshire, you know, kind of a, a university that's kind of on the outside. Uh, and that was after a long time. And by then, even American corporations were starting to pull out. So, and in fact, what you describe here with regard to the gap, first of all, we, don't forget, we're not a majority. I mean, you're right that there's a big change, but that's a long way from saying, you know, we speak for the people, you know, it's a, the Maoist slogans, got a long way to go. Uh, but it's a big change. But even, but just think about American politics. I mean, even where the public is overwhelmingly in favor of something, it almost never affects policy if it harms uh, business interests. Okay, so take, say, uh, uh, take, say, health care, big issue. I mean, right now we're all supposed to... Uh, you know, be worried about uh, how to cut the deficit. And a pretty straightforward way to get rid of the deficit. Uh, and uh, any economists who look at this are fully aware of it. You want to get rid of the deficit, uh, establish a health care system like other industrial countries. Now, that's not exactly a utopian goal. They take, you know, every other industrial country has national health care systems which have about half the per capita cost of the United States and generally have better outcomes and, you know, don't have uh, tens of thousands of people uh, uh, without insurance. So, in fact, you know, I can refer you to the sources if you want, but it's been worked out. If we had the same kind of health care system as other industrial countries, uh, we would not only not have a deficit, we'd have a surplus. Is anybody suggesting that? I mean... Yeah, it sounds insane. You know, how can you oppose the insurance companies and the financial corporations? I mean, they're the guys who fund elections. They're the ones who put Obama into office. So, you know, that's uh, you know maybe a third of corporate profits. You can't offend them. Doesn't matter what the public wants. I mean, when uh, Obama gave away the public option, and remember, he gave it away without even a, an effort. I was over the opposition of about close to two-thirds of the population. Did it make any difference? Uh, when he made his deal with the pharmaceutical corporations, drug prices in the United States are you know, two or three times as high as anywhere else. Uh, uh, the reason is that the U.S. is, I think, alone in the world in having a legislative framework which prevents the government from negotiating drug prices. So, of course, they're sky high. Uh, every other country does that. Actually, the U.S. does it, too, for the Veterans Administration. And there, the drug prices are more or less not, not under control. Well, Obama gave that one away, too. There was only one poll about it, but it was 85% opposition. Did it make any difference? No. I mean, if you have a country that's run by concentrations of capital, at the moment it happens to be heavily the financial institutions, as long as the public's, you can keep the public quiet, it doesn't matter what they think. And that's true on issue after issue. And furthermore, the public knows it. You, go, you take a look at, for years, you know, ever since the Reagan years, there have been regular polls, you know, good polling agencies on, where people are asked, um, who do you think the government works for? And you get figures like about 80% often saying that the government works for the few and the special interests, not for the people. Well, I don't, they don't ask who you mean by special interests, but 
That would be the next question. But uh, whatever people mean, they're basically correct. And that's one of the, <clears throat> one of the reasons, I'm sure, why there's such uh, anger, frustration, you know, uh, um, hatred of all institutions. I mean, the attitudes towards just about every institution are in, you know, like often single digits, double digits. Uh, well, because people hate everything that's going on, but they don't think they can do anything about it. And what uh, does get done is, uh, is extremely destructive. But, so, so yeah, you're right about Israel, but it generalizes. We've got a big problem about uh, the democracy deficit in the country. Can you hear me? Right. <laughs> um, a lot of the issues you talked about have been confirmed in the Palestine papers that have come out recently. Can you talk about how those papers have not been covered in the American media? I'm sorry, I didn't get the question. Uh, can you discuss why the Palestine papers, which have been published in other countries, have not been covered by American media sources? Other countries have not been covered? The Palestine Papers, the WikiLeak-like documents. About the WikiLeak? Palestine Papers. Oh, the Palestine Papers. Yeah. Can you speak about why those haven't been covered by American media sources when they have been covered by other uh, sources such as Britain? Actually, I don't, you know, I don't read the British press as carefully as I do here, but I didn't see a lot of coverage of them in the British press. There was some, but not a lot. But my feeling on the case of the Palestine Papers you know, personally, I mean, I read them, and they were interesting, but, you know, I thought they were mostly just embarrassing. I mean, what they reflected was the complete desperation on the part of the Palestinians. No matter what they give away, they just laughed at, and they're desperate. It reflected extreme arrogance on the part of uh, Israel and the United States. If you read the statements of, you know, uh, Condoleezza Rice and uh, the others, they're just full of contempt for the Palestinians. You know, take what we give you or shut up, basically. Uh, yeah, we sort of know that, and the Palestine papers brought it out kind of graphically, but I didn't see any, maybe I missed it, but I didn't see any real major leaks. Now, there were some of the WikiLeaks documents that did have uh, revealing information, and much of that really didn't get covered. But I just didn't see it in the Palestine papers. Actually, some of what came out in WikiLeaks bears on the question that somebody asked you did, I think, about US support for Israel. So some of the WikiLeaks documents from, I forget where they came from, uh, listed, uh, actually this report, as far as I found, only appeared in Israel. Uh, uh, listed uh, uh, strategic locations throughout the world, locations that are of very high security concern to the United States, so we must be careful to preserve them. And there were maybe a dozen or so. Uh, one of them was right near Haifa, uh, the Rafael the Military Production uh, Center, which produces cluster bombs and other advanced uh, materials. Well, okay, U.S. government considers that one of the main strategic sites to, uh, that we have to protect in the world. And if you look more closely, uh, Rafael, which is Israel's biggest military producer, uh, is their military production in Israel is closely linked to the U.S., you know, all integrated. Uh, they actually moved a lot of their uh, management facilities to the United States uh, because they have a closer easier contacts with the funders and so on when they're here than when they're in Israel. It's kind of like an offshoot of the United States, you know, a military intelligence high-tech offshoot. So that was interesting. And there are others. Now, there are other important leaks, but at least I didn't see a lot in the Palestine papers other than it was kind of embarrassing, an embarrassment for the Palestinians. And it should have been an embarrassment for us to see the way uh, American leaders are talking to them. Okay, um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming.